Oh, nice. Okay. Well, welcome. Um, so uh, we go by a bunch of names because everybody's naming us. When in in uh, in in our ceremonies, uh, the only word we use is Anishinaabe. We don't hear the word Ojibwe or Chippewa. We uh, uh, the only word we use is Anishinaabe. But uh, the Anishinaabe nation is huge uh, across North America. And uh, so Ojibwe is used to kind of uh, describe kind of a dialectical difference that makes us a little bit different from the rest of the Potawatomi's, Ottawa's, and uh, uh, Algonquians, and, and Crees, and OG Crees. Uh, it's just to separate us geographically by dialect. So it's kind of like, uh, uh, it's kind of like a New York, uh, New York uh, accent versus uh, uh, maybe a Mississippi accent. Our, our accent is uh, geographically common in this area up here. So we're Ojibwe. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, US government couldn't say, couldn't uh, enunciate Ojibwe, so they just call it Chippewa. So you might hear the word Chippewa. You see it on Red Lake Place too, Red Lake Band of Chippewas. So Chippewa, Ojibwe, we're all uh, Anishinaabe and we're connected to some of the surrounding uh, uh, tribes. You see here smudge, you're gonna see a lot of smudge here. You know, maybe I think that'll be later on. We smudge to uh, uh, cleanse our minds to get ready uh, for the day, to kind of a, a, kind of a, a meditation, uh, a, a daily meditation. Uh, First of all, we call North America, we call it Turtle Island. And as you see, North America, from a grand view, does represent a turtle. And in our creation story, uh, the earth flooded and it was recreated and it was put on a turtle's back. And uh, these are spiritual ent ent entities too. So uh, uh, it's not necessarily physical, but it's also metaphysical understanding of our worldview as us Anishinaabe. Yeah. Uh, originally, we came from uh, uh, Pleiades. And you ever see a Subaru symbol on a Subaru car? Same thing, Pleiades, seven ladies, seven seven women, the seven uh, women. Uh, we came from there. We were lowered down to earth from there. We still have a spiritual connection to to there. That's our, where our ancestors are from. and. Uh, uh, we were lowered onto the earth and we were lowered into uh, uh, North North America. This is where we were put as Anishinaabe. We did not come across the Bering Straits. We do not have Bering Strait DNA. We have unique DNA. Uh, DNA uh, the Bering Strait was, is a theory. And the theory was based, well, if Adam and Eve were the first humans, where did Indians come from? Well, they must have ran across the Bering Strait. No, we were put here. Creator put us here in North America. Uh, this is our story. There are many creation stories. The Bible is a story that was handed down, handed down, and then written down. So it's a story. This is the Bible story. This is our story. All right. So uh, the Creator, the Creator put the four elements here: fire. You can see from the stars. In the stars they had stardust and stardust kind of made the earth uh, it was kind of not solid it was more of a liquid form and then uh, and then uh, the earth was created and then the wind after the water and the earth that made wind and the Sun on it so the four elements were put here on the earth and uh, and we see the fires inside the trees from photosynthesis the Sun comes down and uh, <clears throat> These are the four elements that make up the foundation of the earth and the creator. The creator put the uh, plants here. And uh, everything depends on plants. Then the animals and the birds and the swimmers are put here. And lastly, we're the Anishinaabe. We're the least important. If you remove the fish, uh, we'd be in trouble because they, uh, they have a lot to do with the ecosystem of the entire earth. If we remove the birds, it, We'd have a difficult time on Earth. Uh, but, uh, if we moved the animals, if we moved the plants, we'd all die. So people are, are the least important in the web of life. 
And so we respect fish, we respect birds and animals. We don't overfish, we don't overhunt, we don't clear cut, we don't strip mine. Uh, we're, we're told to sh show that respect and that balance. Then there are some spirits that were put here on the earth to watch over us. Bigfoot, mermaids, uh, uh, little people. You, some people might, different places have like elves and dwarves, but we have the little people. And uh, there's a whole bunch of them that are put here over to watch over us. There's wild man, wild woman. Woman, when we go out into the woods, there's someone always watching over us, protecting us, making sure we're safe. They're put here to teach us and to watch over us. Uh, well, sure enough, uh, we were told what to do and how to behave, and uh, we didn't listen. We didn't respect the birds. We would just, just we would uh, just hunt for trophy hunting, and just take the prime meat and waste it. And then pretty soon we were fighting each other. So the creator said, I had enough of that. that I, that's, you guys aren't listening. So the creator flooded the earth, pushed the reset button and flooded everything. And redid all of this again. I redid all of these, put them back on. And we had the recreation. In our story, uh, our, our uh, uh, kind of like our uh, teacher, like there's Jesus or Muhammad or Buddha. We have Nain of Buju. And Nain of Buju is half spirit, half human. He sent the animals down to go get a piece of the earth under the flood so he could recreate the earth. He put the earth on the turtle's back. And uh, uh, and he told us to, uh, here you got a couple of, well, the original rules, we had two commandments. One was uh, respect everything and everybody. And uh, the other one was used tobacco to show that respect. So along the ways, uh, we were given, uh, uh, I guess, uh, kind of our government system. There were uh, six animals that came out of the ocean, six spirits. They emerged out of the ocean because we used to live on the, uh, on the, along the ocean. And uh, one of them was too strong, so we had to go back. It was too powerful. And... Uh, so the ones that remained was the marten, the bullhead. These are spiritual entities. The marten, the bullhead, the deer, the bear, and the crane. And uh, they each had uh, a certain area of responsibilities and teachings. And uh, the marten, well, the animal, has claws. Uh, and this represents all animals with claws. Because now, nowadays, we, nowadays we have, you know, 30-some clans. But these are the original five. But this one, the Martin, represents the one with the claws. That Martin, that spirit representing the Martin, was in, was in charge of the military, the war, warrior society, and uh, strategic planning. And uh, the leader, kind of lead where we're going to go and, and protect us. Then there was the swimmers, the bullhead representing all the ones in the water, all, all of the uh, clans. And the job of that clan was for to be teachers and mediators. So if there was disputes or arguments or it was a split vote, tie vote, they'd be the mediators and the teachers. So you could think of the swimmers as like, they're the deep thinkers in the deep waters. Kind of a pun, the deep thinkers. And uh, uh, that's the job of all of the uh, water clan members. Uh, and then the deer is in charge of uh, uh, providing for us food and clothing with their hides. They're the artisans, the peaceful ones. And the bear was in charge of the bear, big dude, like this guy here, bear climb. Yeah, he, uh, they're, they're the police force in the community. Just settle disputes, settle fights. But the, the bear, the bear is in charge of all the medicines. The, the bear goes around and knows all the roots and all the plants. Bear knows everything. Bear is boss of all the animals on the earth. And uh, so the med so for medicines, they're the health department, police force. We got the military. We have the education department. And we have the, uh, uh, I guess, human services, protect uh, uh, human services. And then we have uh, the crane. That's me. I'm from the crane clan uh, leadership. And because the birds are up high and they get to see the big view of what's going on over here and what's going on over there. Uh, 
The Korean clan. I belong to the Korean clan. What clan do you belong to? Bear. So he's Bear clan. And uh, so it's my job as a member of the Korean clan is to uh, learn about leadership, such as listening and speaking what the will of the people's voice is. That's my job. And uh, a lot of stuff comes with leadership. So anyways, these five spirits adopted the Anishinaabe or Ojibwe and grouped them into sections. And, and this is our government system of how we look at the world. So much like the United States has the executive branch, that's the crane, uh, judiciary branch, I suppose that would be the mediators, the health department, and uh, human services, etc. Right? So that's our clan system. So we're kind of losing the clan system a little bit. A, a long time ago, uh, a long time ago, you'd live with your clan in your area. You'd have to marry out of your clan, bring them in. And as your families grew, your your area grew. And uh, you'd have like the oldest guy would be, and it's uh, the clans are follow the father's side because they're hunting systems. And it, it would make more sense to have the woman be the, follow the woman's side because you always know who your mom is. Might not know who your dad is. But it's a hunting society, which is based on men. So we follow the male side uh, of our clan. So um, all my kids are crane clan, etc. cetera. No, but that's the clan system. You see our, our Red Lake flag? There's a whole bunch of clans on there. Um, and now it's a, just a, 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 a survey of, they did a survey of what are the major clans in the Red Lake area. And those are the ones that popped up on the Red Lake flag. Uh, and they all come from the original five. So if you see a bird on there, it's from the from the bird clan. If you see an animal on there with claws, it's part of the Martin clan, original Martin clan. All the fish ones like turtle, uh, uh, etc. that you'll see, they're all part of the original five. That's our clan system. And then along the way, we also have our value system. There's a story that kind of tied with when uh, everyone was being disrespectful and stuff like that and they reflooded the earth. Uh, there was a kid that was brought up into the heavens up with the spirits up there. And they taught him these seven values. These are the primary values. There's a million values, but these are the primary ones. So you're gonna see our school district uses these seven in their uh, social emotional learning. Uh, multi-tier support systems for behaviors and what we're teaching in the school district uh, and this is a big part of our uh, uh, what we're trying to teach across the school system is these here so it came from a, a vision where a kid was brought into heaven heavens long ago given these seven to teach the people to be good to each other and you can use all of these as uh, however you want. You can use them as a mind mapping. Like I'm in, when I'm in admin, when I'm in a meeting, how would honesty help me in, in uh, admin? So, well, I would need to be honest and forthcoming, uh, telling them, uh, uh, telling them uh, uh, how I feel, being honest with them, what I think. Uh, what about being brave in a meeting, courage? You know, if I have something I want to say, I feel I need to say, I should have the courage to say it during that meeting. Uh, uh, truth. So what's the difference between truth and honesty? Well, truth is uh, uh, truth is a, a kind of a part of facts, but honesty is more of integrity, integrity, that you're not hiding something, you're not leaving off some of the facts. Uh, uh, this is more of an integrity thing. And so you see, uh, we have animals that kind of represent these values. Here's Bigfoot. That's one of those spirits that were put here to watch over us. People see Bigfoot around here every now and then. He's a spiritual being, so he doesn't reveal himself to everybody. And we got buffalo, eagle. These are all iconic animals in our, in our culture. The animals are kind of like mediums between the power of the creator and us. 
and we use these uh, animals to uh, represent different things such as courage, bear, medicines, and the bear clan. If we didn't have these mediums, it, uh, uh, we'd have a direct line to the Creator. We'd be overwhelmed. It'd be too powerful to know everything the Creator does and we'd probably burn out a few circuits in our brains. So we use these things to kind of sort things out. And uh, you know, they are a, a medium. So that's our, our, our clan system, or our values. We, uh, in our stories, we lived along the coast, all the way up here. And, and, and some of our, uh, our, our prophets had a vision. Our dreams, our dreams and our visions, like when we go on a vision quest and sit out in the woods for four or seven days with no food or water, and we're, we're looking for a spiritual revelation of what we need to do to guide us in the future. Well, these prophets had these visions. They said, hey, somebody's coming across the ocean, and, uh, uh, and uh, if you guys don't move, you're all going to die. And they, they, we, they, they call it eight fires prophecies, seven fires prophecies. So one was, you guys, you got to move or you're going to die. And then, uh, remember the movie, uh, Ten Commandments? Moses got up and left the people, led the people out to great exodus. We had, we had a great exodus. This, this, this sacred shell came out of the ocean and it lit up the sky to the west. And it was a brilliant light up in the sky. And we were to follow that. And it moved to a number of different locations. And we had to move our whole nation. Of course, some of them stayed back. And what happens is they got the epidemics. All of the diseases that came from, you know, you know, Europe was trading with Africa and Asia. So they shared all their diseases and built up our resistance over, over hundreds of years. Well, when they came over here, we got them all at once, and it just wiped out 90% of our population. They're, they're just getting wiped out here. So anyways, we're moving along, following our uh, our Seven Fires prophecies, and it's move or die. <coughs> and uh, we, had our, we have our, uh, our religion called Medeu, and we have a Medei Lodge over in Panema. And... Uh, in that that uh, Medeirion helps us with health. It's like uh, if your life energy goes way down, go through Medeirion and it charges your batteries back up. So anyways, uh, prophecy number two was to move to Detroit. We finally made it to Detroit. The next one said, you got to keep moving until you come where uh, food grows on the water. And that's wild rice. And that's wild rice is only over this way. So we kept moving. Uh, moved over to Fond du Lac and then up into these islands up here, Madeline Islands, up in the Apostle Islands. And they said that there's a light-skinned race coming. He's either going to be in brotherhood or death. Watch his hands. Might shake your hand and have a gun in the other one. And if we look at what uh, Christopher Columbus did, he murdered millions and millions of people. And people over here stole land and kept moving west, taking land. So, is it brotherhood or death? I don't know. It, it could still be undecided. Could be going on right now, making that decision. And number five was uh, falsehood of the Western ways, their religion. And that's not for us. We have ours. We've had ours from way before contact. And uh, in our stories, remember we said respect everything? That was uh, number one commandment. We've got two commandments. One is respect everything. Two is use tobacco to show that respect. Uh, uh, so like when we take a plant or something, we put tobacco or talk to that plant. And uh, the other one is respect everything. So in our stories, the Creator gave all people on earth religions. And we have our own that's tied to this land. Uh, so uh, anyways, the next one was about sickness. And sure enough, all the all the all the epidemics, all the uh, all the epidemics from out uh, the three continents over across the oceans, or uh, all the other continents came here. We got them all at once. And uh, number seven, the seven prophecies, which is about now uh, nowadays, if you look at time, is the 
rebirth of our our religion, and we're seeing a massive exit, a uh, return to our uh, uh, traditional teachings, our traditional uh, 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 religion, if you want to call it a religion, or spirituality. We don't call it religion; we call it spirituality because there's no entity that governs us. We're all individual and free to move. No one can give rules to us. We're all free. So, anyways, that's the great migration. We used to be over here, now we're spread out all the way over here, but mostly here is our homeland uh, now. Uh, the Dakota used to be here, but if you look through the, uh, if you look through time, there's always been movement. We've always been moving back and forth. And uh, this is now Anishinaabe land. This kind of shows where all the Anishinaabe are. This is the lands that we inhabit. These people down here are Potawatomis. They used to be called Anishinaabe, and uh, they still are Anishinaabe, but we kind of broke up into areas. This is mostly Ojibwe country here. And this is Ottawa's, this is Algonquin's, and uh, uh, some more uh, Ojibwe's out this way. Of course, here's Red Lake. I don't know what the, I don't know why this is red. Chippewa, yeah, same thing. Chippewa, Ojibwe. All of these are all part of the Anishinaabe Nation. And uh, it's huge, it's massive. And so uh, we've lived on, uh, before contact, we've uh, lived on uh, annual seasonal activities, big ones. You know, it's all about making sure we've got food to live. And so we, wild rice, and these are the school themes. When you look at cultural themes for, hey, I want to integrate culture. I was told to integrate culture. Well, the theme for September is wild racing. Of course, you're always hunting, but uh, wild race, wild racing, that's this right here. Go out on the lake, go to wild races, pull it in, shake it so that uh, our ripe ones fall in. And don't hit it too hard, you break it. Leave the green one still on the stock, respect it. The harvesting gardens, uh, we have huge gardens. We weren't, uh, we, we had huge community gardens. There weren't so much farming uh, as we know farming. But then in December, we do a lot of storytelling. Of course, you're out, long time ago, we'd be out in, uh, out in a wigwam in the middle of winter. Uh, during the winter time, uh, the communities would break up and go far out into the woods into small hunting groups because uh, uh, there wasn't enough uh, food supplies to just stay in one spot. So they'd spread out. And in the winter time, uh, you go out to hunting camp and be small groups. Of course, the nights are long, it'd be kind of boring. No TVs, no uh, smartphones. So storytelling was big. And they tell the legends, the stories of, of our folklore. Uh, trapping, snaring, maple sugar, spearing, planting, gardening, berry picking, and fishing. Of course, they're not relegated to just those times, but that's the main mean time that they do that or that we do that and then uh, you'll see here in this school we use uh, tobacco tobacco for us is uh, our way of communicating with the creator each plant and each tree has a different gift or characteristic and uh, the tobacco has the gift of knowing your thoughts and your feelings uh, by just by touching it and so uh, like uh, Catholics will have a rosary when they do their prayers the the Muslims they'll get down on all they'll prostrate themselves and put their forehead on the ground get up look to the left and look to the right just looking at all of creation uh, for us we use tobacco and uh, we use tobacco for many more things than that uh, whenever we go ask an elder something or ask somebody to help us to do something we got to give them tobacco if i wanted to go uh, uh if i wanted to get someone to come help me do something a uh, ceremony or ask for their cultural knowledge i got to give them tobacco first and once they get that tobacco there's no goofing around there's no telling lies making things up and uh, you got to be honest once you have that tobacco and that means you're connecting with the creator so you'll see a tobacco sometimes, not a whole lot here, but you'll, you'll see uh, um, these other medicines we use uh, for smudging. 
So I've been around, uh, I've been to, uh, I've been to Europe, I've been to Africa, I've been to Asia, I've been to Australia, and uh, they all have smudgy. And uh, when I was in, when I went to Catholic church, Catholic school, they had smudge too, Franken and Murray, I believe that was. And, and anyways, that, that chases off the bad spirits. And we do that too. And you'll see, we'll use a lot of it as sage. You'll smell sage burning. Of course, I had a small uh, smell vocabulary. When I used to smell it, I thought someone was smoking marijuana because that's the only plant burning I was used to or someone burning leaves. Is someone burning leaves? No, is that pot? No, no, it's sage. After all, you get to know the difference. Uh, this is a more sweeter smell. And uh, we use sweet grass. It, it, it just grab some of the sweet grass and braid it up like a hair braid. And this, this one calls in the good spirits. Sage uh, is a repellent. It pushes away all the bad spirits, bad thoughts. So if you're, if you're feeling crabby or if kids are crabby, we smudge. And that pushes away the crabby feeling, crabby thoughts, crabby feeling. This one calls in the good ones. And cedar is uh, all around medicine. You burn it, chase everything away. Boil it into tea, it's, uh, uh, it, uh, it flushes out your system, all the impurities in your system. And those are the four medicines that we, you'll see in the school. Then we have some very sacred items. And uh, these ones are, are to be handled with great care and respect. They're spiritual items. They're like uh, 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 the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, the chalice or a crucifix or or anything sacred these are some of our most sacred items so uh, we can't use them casually or grab them casually I'm not supposed to grab anybody else's pipe because it has a spiritual being connected to the owner and uh, they kind of blend and become spiritually connected so I'm not allowed to touch other people's pipes there's some pipes that I can because they're like a community pipe. There's different kinds of pipes. There's doctoring pipes. There's a ceremonial pipes. For, there might be one that belongs to a drum. Uh, like this drum has a pipe connected to it. No doubt this is a drum or a lake. It's over at the Tribal College now. And uh, the drums are sacred. Our rattles are sacred. And the feathers are sacred. The feathers are a long time ago. The creator was going to re re do the earth again. It was mad because everybody was treating each other bad. And uh, But the eagle said, I want to intervene. I bet you I can find someone good to help teach. And, and uh, maybe that's the one that went up and got the seven valleys. But the eagle intervened and protected the humans. And so went up to the creator. The creator says, okay, I'll give, it a, I'll give him another try. And uh, so the eagle feather is a prayer stick. Which like we hold that when we pray. Also, um, eagle feathers is part of the warrior society. Uh, if you're a warrior, and there's different ways of earning a feather. One is by touching an enemy. One is by hitting an enemy. One is by uh, sh wounding an enemy. And one is by killing an enemy. Any contacts with the enemy, you would earn a feather. So feathers are are basically a warrior society. Uh, items or else sacred prayer items and the rattle uh, I don't know too much about rattles uh, I know that during uh, the Big Bang for us there was nothingness and then the rattle came and uh, all of a sudden there was a duality throughout the universe and it calls all the spirits in those are sacred rattles of course you can grab any old rattle if you want if it hasn't been blessed it's just still a rattle but once it's been through ceremony and blessed, then it becomes a sacred item. Uh, those are those are our sacred items. So if you see them there, uh, probably don't want to mess with them. Just uh, ask, um, like Jesse or one of the language and cultural teachers to take care of that. Um, so long ago, oh. So long ago, uh, America had the revolution and they were looking for land. They went into great debt. They borrowed a lot of money 
uh, from the French and other countries to fight the British. They went into huge debt, so they needed money. So they went into Indian territory and started uh, land grabbing. And, uh, uh, and during the land grab, uh, uh, during, uh, they, they were selling land to raise money to pay off the debt after the American Revolution. And uh, what does this say? Yeah, these are land. Go out, get land for 59 bucks. And it's great, great rush, uh, rush out to take land. So long ago, before 1492, or before the uh, colonies, we owned all of the land. There were 400 languages, 400 different tribal languages. 90% of our population is wiped out by, by disease. You imagine having your systems, e uh, economic, uh, religious, all your systems set up that all depended on the entire population and networks of those different systems. And all of a sudden, 90% of them are wiped out. Uh, people are wiped out. That, we're, we're kind of seeing that right now uh, during COVID, really messed up our, uh, our shipping systems and rare earth systems or can't buy a can't buy a PlayStation 5 because uh, uh, the rare earth materials are hard to get around got interrupted one of this and that, and that wasn't even 90 percent of the population that was a small percent of the population that died from COVID imagine 90 percent what that would do to your systems so the uh, uh, the early years, the fur trade, uh, Western colonies were taken out. The colonies were taking over land. Fur trade was coming uh, across. The fur trade came all the way in here to to buy uh, uh, furs. Uh, it was a big market in uh, Europe, and uh, uh, America, the United States Army was growing, and. Uh, uh, in the 1830s, they decided they were going to move all of the Indians west of the Mississippi. So they took the armies and they they grab all these people and force them over there, march them under gunpoint. Half of them would die walking over to the reservation. They were going to stick them in Oklahoma. Uh, they had manifest des destiny. That's it's God's will that we go coast to coast, and uh, we had treaties. So treaties were because they couldn't just all right kill us because we had some guns too. We were fighting back. Uh, if, if you were totally beaten and conquered, there'd be no treaties. You're simply conquered. We're, we weren't conquered. We went into treaties because we fought back. So it's kind of, oh, we can't seem to settle this. Let's make a treaty. Lots of treaties. So we had treaties up to 1871. They said, no more new treaties. But treaties, according to the Constitution, are the supreme law of the land. That means they're greater than any state law and you can't break them unless the act of Congress breaks the entire treaty. So we still have treaties today. Uh, treaty of Red Lake, why a treaty? Why Red Lake owns 100% or 99% of the land within its border? Because the treaty still stands. We still have hunting and fishing rights uh, from our treaties. They said, we want your land, but we'll let you hunt. Okay, all right then, we signed. So we still have uh, treaty rights today. Um, some of the reservations, well, I won't go into a lot, but that's too much. Oh, okay, I will. Leech Lake Reservation, same with White Earth, probably 50 miles by 50 miles. They said, uh, we want more land. We're going to make a law that for every Indian, we're going to give them each 80 acres, and then we're going to sell the rest. And, and they, they didn't even ask us if we wanted to do that. They just said, this is what we're going to do. We're gonna give all all the heads of household, male heads of household, uh, eighty acres, and they did. And there was a, we lost, uh, we lost uh, uh, ninety-seven percent of our land inside Leech Lake. You see, ninety-seven percent of the land inside the reservation is non-Indian land. Same with White. But Red Lake said, "Hell no, we won't go." No, they uh, uh they they refused it. That's why Red Lake. Has a, owns 99%. The only reason why they own 99%, the tribal chairman was buddy with some non Indian dude and let him have the, uh, set up a Red Lake gas station, Red Bee store. That one on, on the south side is non Indian. He was real good buds with the tribal chairman way back. Otherwise, it would be 100, still be 100%. 
1890, it's just little speckles left. The, uh, um, the United States government teamed up with the education department and teamed up with the church. The church and the education department and the government got together, they sat down and said, hey, we need to get rid of the Indian problem. These Indians, they don't seem to want to be Americans. They still hunting and they still have tribal government. They still have their ceremonies. They still have their language. We need to take that all away from them. Uh, so we're going to go house to house and grab every single kid and bring them on to uh, uh, boarding schools. And we'll bring it far away so they don't run away home. We'll take them all. Uh, the ones from up here, we'll bring them all the way down to Pipestone. And uh, that way they can't run home. And uh, every day in the boarding school, if you spoke your language, you were beaten. And uh, uh, if you, you weren't allowed, you were only, you had to practice uh, church prayers and you had, to, it was a regiment. Every day you get up, you're gonna get up, you're gonna scrub floors, you're gonna get up, you're gonna go to the local farmer and provide free labor. They were supposed to be teaching them uh, uh, domestic skills, but they didn't. It was basically, it was a, it was a farm for free labor for the communities. But uh, uh, one of the things that was terrible is that these boarding schools attracted predators, sexual predators. So there was a lot of rape and abuse going on in these, and these were for like one, two, three generations. From 1890, my mom went to boarding school. She was one of the last boarding school people in Pipestone, Minnesota. And uh, so just before me, let me see, I was born in 62. So she must have been there in the 50s or 40s, somewhere around there. And she ran away too. A couple of her friends said, let's get out of here. They took off running. And uh, uh, anyways, so they took our language, they took our culture, they took our religion from us. And go back to the seven fire prophecy said we're gonna pick it back up. So part of that picking back up is the school here is we're gonna pick our language back up. And so we ask all teachers to learn three thematic sets of words, just a small set of words. One is uh, uh, greetings. We have big posters you can hang in your room. You might see them in the other rooms. Greetings, affirmations, and classroom commands. So the greetings are, hello, how you doing? I'm fine, you? Uh, see you later, okay, take care. Simple as that. We have some videos out for that. And uh, the other one is affirmations, doing a good job, you can do it, and whatever. There's a whole a short list. We ask all teachers, all of you to learn those. And it's not a whole lot, but uh, really nice. Uh, some of the school, or all of the schools, they're working together to support each other to learn those. So you see teachers using those those set of re, uh, required uh, uh, vocabularies with each other and with their kids, and it's uh, pretty uh, pretty awesome. Uh, and uh, uh, so what we faced was genocide, killing of the members. They were just killing us, man. There were scouts. There's money for scouts. If you brought in an Indian scout, you you'd get uh, 50 bucks, which was a lot back then. Mental mental harm, yeah, they're telling us what we were doing was evil, even though all we we're doing was talking to God, saying thank you for everything you give us. And uh, inflicting uh, calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Yeah, that was a boarding school. And imposing measurements intended to prevent births. IHS here in Red Lake, Indian Health Services, the Indian clinic that the government puts up here so we have uh, part of our treaty rights with, was health, guaranteed health. Uh, and, uh, uh, and in Cass Lake, they were sterilizing Indian women all the way up into the 70s without their knowledge of it. And uh, they got caught in the 70s. And what else we got? Yeah, that's it right here. So uh, we've, and it's a crime, it's an international crime. United, by the United Nations. And the U.S. has a long history of doing that to us. So we've been traumatized. We traumatize uh, historic trauma and contemporary trauma. Really messes up, it actually messes up your DNA and uh, it messes up your communities. So we are a trauma community. Uh, trauma. 
a sudden, unexpected, overwhelming, intense, emotional blow, series of blows. So let me talk a little, let's go back to boarding school. My buddy lives in Cass Lake. He, he went to a boarding school in Canada. He said, every day, the nuns would tell us, don't listen to your aunties and uncles, the cultural teachings. Those are bad. Those are the devil. And you hear that all day long, your whole working day. And uh, as a kid, you're, you're told your Indian ways, your language, your culture, everything, your religion, the way you look at the universe is all wrong. You need to learn the white way, the European way, the Christian way. And uh, uh, if you're taught that all day long, that's one day. Remember, can you imagine every day for eight, nine years of being told that over and over? It really traumatizes you. So anyways, the trauma was felt in the community for many, uh, many decades. So that causes effect and change into the uh, uh, community. So a quick history. 1924, we finally got the right to vote. 1934 Reorganization Act, they came through and they said, hey, the, uh, hey, they're still, they, they, uh, what, is, what is his name? Who was, who was the president in the, in the wheelchair? Roosevelt. So Roosevelt said, hey, uh, go on and take a look, see how the Indians are doing. And came back and said, man, they're taking all their land, stealing everything, and they're, they're diseased, they're sick, and they, they won't even let them off the reservation. And you couldn't leave the reservation, otherwise you could get shot. And uh, and you had to get a letter from the Indian Asian. The Indian Asian was a thief. He was stealing everything. Shipments would come in that were owned, owed to the Indians. He'd steal a whole bunch of it. His buddies would steal a whole bunch of it. And they'd leave the rotten leftovers for the Indians. But uh, they, he said, uh, man, it's, it's, really, it's really bad on the reservation. So they passed a new law saying, here, we're going to give you a new government system. And you can use that one or use your traditional one, but you need to charter it and incorporate it into law. And uh, so with that, um, we used to be hereditary chiefs. Now we switch over to elected government, government and populist vote. And that's how Red Lake is right now, populist vote. And the chiefs are, are kind of honorary members. Uh, Indian Relocation Act, they said, we're gonna get rid of the reservations. Let's move all the Indians into the cities, give them jobs promising jobs and everything. And so a lot of the uh, a lot of the families left the reservation to go like down to Minneapolis. And of course they got down there and there there's no housing, there was discrimination. So you had a bunch of pop tents, uh, homeless tents set up around the rivers, around the river, around Mississippi. And uh, it wasn't as great as they were told. And they started moving back to the rest. That didn't work. They were trying to get rid of the reservations. And then, uh, in the 70s, amidst all of these false promises and trauma and all this, AIM started, AIM said, that AIM started protesting and forming uh, uh, citizen patrols for Indians, because Indians were being, uh, you'd find them floating down the river in Minneapolis, because uh, the cops would take them down, beat them to death, and throw them in the river, find a bunch of Indians floating down. So AIM got together and said, no more, no more police brutality, whatever an Indian, Wherever there's cops, we're gonna watch the cops. We're gonna follow them. If the Indian gets arrested, we're gonna follow them all the way to the police station, make sure he gets there. And uh, back then, here we're like, you felt bad. It was, you felt uh, embarrassed to be Indian. It wasn't cool to be Indian. You kind of kept quiet, tried to hide, and pretend like you were Italian or something. And, uh, but they made it so now it was cool to be Indian again. Red power, I'm proud to be Indian. They brought the, uh, they brought the uh, uh, good, it's good to be Indian back in the 70s. Indian Education Act 72, I'm not so sure with that. That's how, you know, they said, look at all, the Indians are scoring low, let's get some stuff to help them out. So they have Indian Ed money to have, uh, uh, like Indian Ed Department in Red Lake here. And, uh, uh, and in the different schools and different programs for Indians, such as trying to get teachers, teacher training programs, et cetera, you name it. Uh, Freedom of Religion Act. We couldn't pra we couldn't practice our religion until 1978. Uh, they could come arrest you, and they could confiscate all of your sacred items and destroy them or auction them off. 
so 78 now it's okay for us to follow our traditions and in the child welfare act uh, my mother was one of the part of the authors of this in 78 she worked for social service the indian social services they're taking all the kids away they're saying they're saying you're unfit because you're indian take the kids away and put them in foster homes now it's a big booming business foster homes lots of money the, the social Social Services Department of the county grew lots of jobs, lots of money. There was big money in the, uh, in foster care, especially Indian kids, move them away. And these kids were having it even worse than the ones that were still home. And because uh, uh, they had no identity, they didn't know they were in abusive homes. Uh, they are bounced from home to home. So finally, uh, they said, no, from now on, if someone needs to be removed from their home, we're gonna find a relative or another Indian, set us straight off to non-Indian. So that's Indian, uh, Indian Child Welfare Act 78. Uh, I think a big one that's missing here is Indian Indian reorganization, I mean, uh, uh, self-determination and self-governance came in the 80s. Self-determination and self-governance said, you know, why should Beltrami County have all the jobs and all the money for, for uh, all the uh, human services? Uh, can't you that that we said we want we want to govern our own uh, destiny our own self-determination so if we're gonna have treatment programs let's have native treatment programs if all of the social services jobs were moved up to here instead of uh, non-indians being the ones working there and uh, that brought jobs up here I think before before the 80s uh, uh, unemployment was like 80 90 percent on the reservations and then now with the self-determination of the uh, 1980s, then there was there was a lot more jobs on the reservation. We were taking everything under, taking control of our own destiny, self-determination. And those are the major, uh, those are the major uh, events. I think it's about it, uh, it uh, that was a crash course on the plight of the red man. And, uh, but we're still here. And uh, well, we're still alive and we're uh, revitalizing and we're getting, uh, we're on our, standing on our own two feet and our own destiny is in our own hands. And uh, we've been taken on the bus of education. For so many years, we've been passengers on the bus of education. Now we have the steering wheel, and it's up to us what we want to do with that steering wheel. And one, and a couple of things that we want to do is one is get our language back. Another one is to incorporate culture into everything that we do. So uh, we are asking you. Well, we're not asking. You, that's that's the the plan of the district is to incorporate language and culture into everything that you do here at the school. Uh, eventually. Uh, I don't think I don't think we are done until the culture gets into the core academics math language arts science uh, art uh, gym uh, when language and culture are embedded in those units and lesson plans then 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 we can say uh, we did a good job so we're gonna keep plugging away Indian Ed's gonna keep plugging away saying Hey, this is your challenge. This is your charge as teachers, isn't to incorporate language and culture. Uh, don't worry. There's a lot of supports. You're not going to be you're not going to be whipped or beaten uh, or anything like that. You're going to be supported, and we're going to help you. And take your time. There's no big rush. You know, you got a year. You got two years. Slowly start learning it. Uh, it's the culture is the great unknown. And how am I supposed to teach the great unknown? And so we need to provide those services and those education. And this is part of it, what I just did, uh, is to get a little bit of background. Uh, you're free to uh, go on the internet and learn more about the uh, Anishinaabe life. And uh, the only thing that we ask you to just kind of stay away from, just go get Jesse or another Native staff, is when it has to do with uh, uh, spirituality or ceremonies or sacred items. Those are, those are like better left to... Uh, the uh, Anishinaabe people on the reservation. <laughs>